Hey you guys! Hope you can find me. Um, today is July 9, 2017 and I'm going to talk a little bit about creativity today. Uh, as usual I have my computer up and I'm just going to be checking to make sure that I am showing up here on Facebook. I, um, I'm in a room of my studio that I don't use for Facebook much and so I'm hoping that um, this is working. I see that some of you are watching, so hopefully uh, things are working okay. One more second. Um, yay! Thanks, you all. Always makes me feel better to see the little thumbs up that I know that um, this is working. Oh, there I am. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Marcus! Canada! I had so much fun in Victoria, Canada. Um, had a few issues with the food at the university, but other than that, the Anway Conference was fantastic. Hi, Carol. Um, beautiful spot, man. Vancouver Island is so amazing. Um, I have to go back there for vacation. That's my only takeaway from that. Besides, the Anway Conference was well run and um, some amazing teachers, and it was a lot of fun. But I am really glad to be back home. <laughs> June was crazy. I taught a lot, so I'm glad to be home for a little while. So I want to talk about creativity today. Um, if you saw my newsletter last week, you know that I've been thinking a little bit about creativity, and a lot of that is in terms of encouraging people to foster their own creativity. Hi, Anne and Beth. Cool. I love seeing you all show up. So, um, I have a lot of notes today. I apologize that I'll be reading some things, but I don't want to miss um, some of the thoughts. Hey, Anne from Australia and Donna. It's so fun to see where you all are from. Um, okay, so there's a little disclaimer. There's a big body of research by psychology and sociology um, about creativity, and I have read almost none of it. So most of what I'm going to say comes from some more popular culture references about creativity and I will give you some of those and um, just from my own experience. Um, and you probably have your own, so if you have a favorite book you can let us know. There are probably hundreds of books about creativity for artists. Um, one book that I keeps popping up to the top of my list a lot is this one by Twyla Tharp and I am sorry that they are backwards. Um, oh, I bet, yeah. Um, I can't turn my camera around because you will see the other side of the room instead of this book. Um, I think there is a way to flip the image so that you see this for real, but I don't know what it is. Um, Twyla Tharp, The Creative Habit, Learn It and Use It for Life. This is an older, it's not older, but it's um, from 2003. Um, just a book that a lot of people reference for um, creativity. And um, Twyla is actually a dancer. And so it's a little bit of a different perspective and an interesting place to start with some really good writing exercises for thinking about your own creativity. Hi Michelle, glad you made it. You didn't miss anything. Um, I, I worry that I do Facebook Lives both on my business page, which is here, and on my private student group. And so I know a lot of people are probably over on the student group page, so hopefully they will find it here. Um, so I will be referring to this Twilight Thart book here and there, as well as a couple other um, books. The first thing I want to talk about, which Twilight talks about a lot in this book and in a lot of other books, other people talk about it, is perfectionism. I think that um, um, we tend to believe, and this might be particularly true of people who go into weaving, I think that weavers tend to be people who like rules and structure, and so we also tend to be perfectionists which um, can be hard on us. Um, and sorry, sometimes I look distracted. It's because I actually can see your questions rolling on the screen, and so I'm taking a second to read, but I actually cannot read and talk at the same time, so um, I apologize for that. It looks like I'm having a, you know, cognitive lapse, but I'm really just reading. Um, so perfectionist. Um, a lot of us are perfectionists and that does get in the way of our creativity. Um, 
we tend to believe that everything has to be perfect, even if we don't consciously realize that we think that. Um, and so, so think about that. Ask yourself how many times you have judged your weaving when you've hardly started. Or did you judge it harshly enough that you actually unwove everything you'd woven or threw it away, cut it off and start it over? Um, or maybe that particular piece was so discouraging that that loom and that weaving is still sitting in your closet and you haven't touched it since you started it and felt discouraged about it. That's some perfectionist, perfectionism um, working there. There is, I hate to tell you this, but there's no such thing as perfection, especially in fiber art. Um, you can't learn how to get better unless you practice. So um, helping yourself let go of perfectionism, I think, is the first big step in creativity. And um, a lot of the questions that you all had about this topic have to do with how do I design and how do I make something creative and how do I move forward in that process. And um, I have some tips for you, but you have to find your own way, of course. Um, Kim Worker is a crochet artist. Her last name is W-E-R-K-E-R, -E -E Kim. She wrote a book called Mighty Ugly, which I, unfortunately I couldn't find in time for this um, Facebook Live, but it's somewhere in my book stash. She is, has built a whole business around encouraging people just to make things, and she wrote this book about um, making things that are ugly. And it's just a way to get yourself started. If you don't believe it has to be perfect when you start, then you're a lot freer with what you are making. So um, she has a point, and her teaching is all about just doing it instead of worrying so much about the result. Something that we, I think as weavers, have a very hard time doing. Um, but if you start out trying to make something ugly, you might discover some interesting things along the way. Um, another point I want to make is about skill. Uh, the ability to execute something is of course important. You have to know the techniques and be able to use them in your own practice. Um, at some point that's more, more important than at other points in your creative career. Um, tapestry weaving is a particular practice that takes um, some skill. And I have um, had a lot of students who get discouraged very quickly because I think mostly because they don't have the skill that they think that they should. Um, okay. Um, I, they get discouraged really quickly because they have this thing in their head that they want to weave and they can't get there. A lot of times Part of that is because they don't have the skill. It might be that they don't have the skill in technique, but it also might be that they don't have the skill in design and that kind of thing. So those are two different things. Um, but no one, I'm telling you, ask any artist, no one can realize the design that they have in, your head, in their head. You have some image in your head of what you want to create. It will never come to pass in a physical object. I, really, I, I just don't think that it's possible. Um, so don't be so hard on yourself when the result isn't what you imagined, because that doesn't happen for any of us. Um, I have a quote that I'm actually going to read, and I wrote a you might remember I wrote a blog post about this um, a year or two ago. Uh, Anne Patchett is a writer, and she wrote um, a book of essays called The Story of a Happy Marriage, and one of the essays is about her writing process. And um, I think it really parallels my own struggles with design in tapestry weaving. So here's the little um, two paragraph quote from Ann Patchett. For me, it's like this. I make up a novel in my head. This is the happiest time in the arc of the writing process. The book is my invisible friend, omnipresent, evolving, thrilling. During the months or years it takes me to put my ideas together, I don't take notes or make outlines. I'm figuring things out, and all the while the book makes a breeze around my head like an oversized butterfly, whose wings were cut from the rose window at Notre Dame. This book I have not yet written one word of is a thing of indescribable beauty, unpredictable in its patterns, 
piercing in its color, so wild and loyal in its nature that my love for this book and my faith in it as I track its lazy flight is the single perfect joy in my life. It is the greatest novel in the history of literature and I have thought it up and all I have to do is put it down on paper and then everyone can see this beauty that I can see. And so I do. When I can't think of another stall, when putting it off has actually become more painful than doing it, I reach up and I pluck the butterfly from the air. I take it from the region of my head and I press it down against my desk and there with my own hand I kill it. It's not that I want to kill it, but it's the only way I can get something that is so three-dimensional onto the flat page. Just to make sure the job is done, I stick it in place with a pin. Imagine running over a butterfly with an SUV. Everything that was beautiful about this living thing, all the color, the light, and movement, is gone. What I'm left with is the dry husk of my friend, the broken body chipped, dismantled, and poorly reassembled. Dead. That's my book. That seems rather depressing, but I think it's actually what happens to a lot of us when we're creating. I design tapestries in my head for the most part. I um, work on them for months or years just in thought. And um, finally, when I go to draw the design, things start to fray a little bit. Um, I add technique and color and dye, and things get further and further from that imagined amazing work that I have been imagining for years. And then the final thing, like this tapestry behind me, is nothing like what I had in my head. Um, but that doesn't mean that it isn't worthy of making or that other people aren't going to love it tremendously. It just means that it's very hard to realize that design that you've been imagining in actual physical materials. So don't sell yourself short because you can't produce in actuality that thing that you have in your head. Nobody can. Um, another thing I want to remind you of is uh, learning. Um, tapestry does have a certain amount of technique and materials and things that you have to learn. You have to cognitively understand how those things work and your hands have to figure out the motor skills. It takes time for that to happen. Um, I used to teach piano when I was much younger and I taught adults and children and it amazed me the difference between teaching adults and children. The adults grasped the cognitive aspects, the how the notes work, what a scale was, how everything goes together, very quickly. They understood that right away. It took them 50 times longer to get the motor skills. The little kids can totally get the motor skills. It takes them no time at all to learn how to play. But they don't understand the structure of the music. So um, it's kind of like that with tapestry, I think. You have to give yourself time. The older we get, we need more time to learn motor skills. Um, and at the same time, we have to work on understanding how it works. Um, so remember that apprenticeships in tapestry historically were seven years long. Some of them probably still are at some of the workshops. Um, if any of you in Australia know what the, um, if they even have apprenticeships at the workshops anymore, the Dovecot or Australian Tapestry Workshop or the Goblon, let me know how long they are. I think often now they hire experienced weavers um, to work there instead of just taking a, a young kid and apprenticing them for seven years. Um, so don't sell yourself short. You do have to practice. Um, you're going to make a lot of stuff that you don't like and you don't have to show that to anybody. Um, part of understanding is also learning the materials and I find a lot of resistance to this as I'm out teaching. Um, there are many, many types of yarn and warp and materials and looms and every different combination of all of that results in a different product. So it takes a lot of um, experimentation to find materials that work for you that result in the product that you want. Um, what for you might be a successful piece. Um, and you have to give yourself time to do that experimenting and you might have to buy some materials that you didn't think you were going to use to achieve your result. Oh, Julie says they've just advertised for a new apprentice weaver at the Dovecot. That would be so fun. Imagine getting to weave at the Dovecot in Edinburgh. That would be awesome. 
If anybody's interested, look it up. I'm interested, but I can't move to Edinburgh right now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you could use the materials and looms and everything else that your teacher or some teacher recommends, but that might not actually produce the sort of weaving that you want to produce. Um, also remember that failure is an um, excellent way to learn. In fact, I'm not sure you can actually learn a lot without some failure. Um, so fail away. You don't have to show anyone. Um, maybe don't always unweave what you're doing. Um, if something feels like it's a failure in the first inch, you might be wrong about that. It might turn into something completely different, but fantastic. So I'm not saying never unweave. I'm just saying maybe keep going. You don't know where it's going to go. Um, one, another book on creativity that, um, I think actually everybody should weave this book. I know it's backwards. The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Stephen is S-T-E-V-E-N Pressfield, P-R-E-S-S-F-I-E-L-D. This is an old book, um, probably the most cited book about creativity in the arts. And it's a short, um, short, quick read with a lot of great nuggets in it. Uh, he talks about um, resistance. He spends a lot of the book talking about resistance, which is a lot of our, um, for a lot of things in life, we have a lot of resistance to doing things. We like to call it procrastination. Um, a lot of those things are invisible. We think for sure that the dishes have to be done before we have time to go weave. Um, but that might not be true. Um, Email is my biggest resistance. I have some weird belief that all emails should be answered and they should be answered quickly. And so if I'm not careful, I can find myself literally answering emails all day long, every day. Um, I have this underlying assumption that all emails must be answered, which is kind of nuts. So I'm working on that one. Pressfield also talks about how to be a professional. And I'm not saying that most of you want to be professional tapestry artists. He's using the word in a different way. Um, he's talking about gaining, having professional practices, gaining organization, being prepared, scheduling times to work, not making excuses for yourself, um, making it a habit basically to work on your art or craft. Um, and those are all important things to talk about in creativity. And I'm going to talk about those more. I'm gonna, you had some great questions and I'm gonna talk about all of that and answer to your questions here in a second. Um, one final idea before I actually start answering those questions. Um, <laughs> good to hear, Elka, I'm so glad you're here. South America, wait, are you in Argentina? I can't remember. Anyway. Hopefully I don't talk too fast. Um, I'm probably hard to understand if, for some people if you have English as a second language, but um, I'll try to slow down. One final idea um, before I talk about the questions and more particular things about creativity. Um, I don't think there's a muse that... Brazil! Thank you, Elka. I'm so sorry. So my Spanish wouldn't even be of any use. Uh, I like that, Janet. She said in art school, a uh, professor, um, um, a professor was critiquing her painting and told her not to change it. Just l learn something for your next um, painting. And Mary, thank you. I will look up that, why my text is ba backwards in Facebook Live, and I will fix it for the next one I do. My apologies, that's procrastination, not actually looking <laughs> up how to fix the backward text in my Facebook Live broadcast. Um, so I want to say something about the muse. I think there's, this is, um, sort of a universally accepted thing, um, that as an artist, you're waiting for some muse to hit you. Some big idea is going to come down and, and slide right into your head and you're going to be, um, completely creative. I, I don't think that's true. There's no lightning bolt, uh, that comes. There's no, um finished idea that's going to be delivered to you. It's all hard work. And um, there is a, if you've ever read um, Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert, she talks about this actually very specifically about how she thinks that the muse is just a little thing that taps you on your shoulder with an idea someday somewhere. 
and that idea is there for a little while and if you don't grab it and put it down somehow that idea moves on to somebody else so that's a, a plea to actually do a little bit of art every day because um, you could wait forever for the quote muse to hit so um, let's see uh, Anne said Australian Tapestry Workshop has residencies for artists to create their own work um, and they can observe tapestry uh, weavers working on the commission tapestries. Now that is something I would like to look into. That would be fun to go to Melbourne for a month or two and do a residency and have the opportunity to watch the weavers work because they are the master tapestry weavers um, in the world. Hi Francesca from Edinburgh. Yay! Y'all are great. Um, so I'm going to move on to some questions. I had some great questions from you all, which prompted a whole bunch more um, talk about creativity. So some are asked, um, and also some admissions from me that I'll probably regret later, but um, hopefully not. Some are asked, what do you find to be your biggest challenge with this aspect of your art, meaning creativity and designing? And... Um, Right off, my first thought when I read that was, time is my biggest challenge. Um, it's abundantly clear that when given time and space, I'm a creative person, as I think we all are. Humans are creative people. Humans are creative by definition. Um, so when I have that time and space, I find myself feeling very creative. But... Um, the reality of running a business in such a way that the rent can actually be paid means um, months sometimes go by that I'm not weaving at all, which is sad, actually, to say out loud. Um, this is exactly what I am not recommending <laughs> to all of you, to let that much time go by without working on art creation and creativity. Uh, if possible, a little bit every day. Um, I just finished a few months of a lot of teaching, so I'm really looking forward to going back to the loom any day now. And I don't have a choice because I have a big tapestry commission um, that I have to start weaving. So that's another thing that can be helpful if you can create some sort of deadline for yourself. It can get you moving. Um, of course, I could think about time in a different way. Uh, maybe my thinking about time as a constraint is just a, a resistance thing, like Pressfield talks about. Um, we have resistances to why we don't want to work and maybe I'm just using, I'm too busy. I'm just too busy is definitely um, a form of procrastination or resistance. <laughs> Anne. Uh, Anne from Australia says, we'd love you to visit us in Australia. We're even nicer than Canadians. If you all saw my um, blog post of last week where I said Canadians were so nice, which is very true. At least the ones in Victoria are very nice. Um, Anyway, so I think that probably the answer to Summer is that I use time as an excuse and that um, more effort to manage that time better is needed in terms of what is actually important. Email, not so much. Creating, a little bit more. Um, Angie asked... Um, I've read, some, I've read of some artists that refer to their creativity as a pool, well, or bucket. Do you think of your creativity as a vessel or perhaps more of a stream? I'm interested in your point of view on replenishing creativity or if you see it as a continuous flow. This is a great question and I would love to know what other people think about this also. Um, I do think that humans in general are creative people. It exists in all of us. We just have to find it. Um, I do also think though that creativity comes and goes depending on our sort of state in the world. I think that both of those metaphors, a well or bucket or a stream, um, are appropriate depending on the person that you are. I often think of my creativity as a stream, but sometimes it definitely dries up if I don't feed it. So I, I absolutely think that we have to give ourselves um, space and ways to feed our creativity or we really aren't very creative. For me, stress is the first killer of my creativity. As when I get... Um, really stressed out, especially if I'm teaching lots and lots of things in a row, like I have been for a few months, um, I just don't feel very creative anymore. And even 
the part of my job where I'm teaching, which is a very creative part of what I do and part of why I love it so much, is because it is creative. If I allow myself to get too stressed, even that becomes um, impacted by stress and the creativity just feels like it goes away. I do think that creative time for a lot of people needs to be scheduled. Um, I didn't used to think this. I thought that creative creativity would always be there whenever I needed it. But it's not really true. Um, when stress piles up, my ability to come up with creative solutions in all, all areas of my life decline. Um, but nowhere more than in designing and creating art. Um, the tapestry diary nature of that petrified forest residency that I did, um, I really loved that. Um, because it was a scheduled thing and it was something that I did every day and um, that I found that to be exceptionally good for enhancing my creativity of course I had a lot of time for that month every day to work on that but that idea can be carried over into even if I had 15 minutes a day to do that and then what I find happens is that that little 15 minutes sort of prompts the flow of the stream and Pretty soon things open up and you're three hours in and you don't even realize that um, all that time has gone by and then you, you're being creative again. Um, so I think that this whole Tapestry Diary thing that people have been doing lately, Tommy Scanlon, Janet Austin, who's here, hi Janet. Um, let's see, who else? Jan Janet Meets does one. Um, there are a few other tapestry weavers who have been doing this for many, many years now. And I admire this practice a great deal because I do think it's this sort of prompt. Every day you're sitting down and thinking about the weaving even just a little bit. And so that kind of a practice, it doesn't have to be a tapestry diary. It could be journaling. It could be um, some kind of art journaling or painting or sketching or um, weaving small tapestries or some way to make yourself um, sit down and work on a tapestry and process. Um, I think that that kind of scheduling thing does help that creative flow keep going day after day. Um, I also think it really does prompt other things to come. Like there's like this little plug in your head that, especially when you're tired or stressed out, um, that has to be kind of blasted through and then the creativity comes back. Let's see. Um, I missed a question here by Anne. Oh, let me answer this, Anne, before I go on to the next question. Um, how does dyeing your weft have an impact on your designs when starting with a cartoon and color notes? Um, that's an interesting question. I was talking about um, designing in my head, and a lot of what I'm designing in my head doesn't have a lot of color when I really think about it. Like, there's there's value happening and sometimes there's some color in my head but it's not very specific a lot of times when I'm drawing a cartoon and it's in black and white maybe with some shading um, and I don't really start with the color almost till last like I have a feeling for what the values are going to be but the color is the last thing I do have a huge stash of dye notebooks now so I can start flipping through them and figure out what color families I want and then what values I need and if it's for a really big piece or a commission then I'll dye samples and actually weave a sample before I start the piece so that I can see what it looks like when woven um, and I think probably what else Anne is asking is how using hand dyed yarn impacts my design I think that um, if you don't dye your own yarn which there is not a problem it's just a different way of working you might be impacted more by what's on your shelf. So you might be designing to the yarn that you own or you know you can buy. And I, on the other hand, can dye almost any color I want, except for some shades of red that still elude me. Um, so I can think up pretty much any color that I want in a piece and with enough sampling I can make it. So there is a difference there. If you're designing two colors that you already own, it might be different than designing like I do where I can pick whatever I want and then go make it. That doesn't mean that what I pick is going to work though. <laughs> I might um, start weaving with it and hate it and have to go back to the um, dye samples. 
So let me go on to Dana asked, um, this is a few more details about things to consider in tapestry weaving and designing. She asked, um, I get overwhelmed with ideas. I need tools to help narrow down choices, which is a super common thing that I hear a lot. Too many ideas, I can't narrow it down. Um, I saw your petrified pieces and I'm wondering how you chose each glimpse of such vast inspiration. I can give you some ideas of that and um, other things I just might not even be able to answer. I, sometimes I don't know, I just see something, and which isn't the answer that you want, but um, I see a line and I think, wow, I can see that woven. But let me um, try to give you a few tips. Uh, I'll talk about, I do want to talk about this more on my blog soon and probably a uh, YouTube video or, video or so. Um, and the two retreats I'm leading in Colorado this month, um, this month and next, are all about how to simplify ideas and um, find your creative center. So we'll be doing a lot of this petrified forest thing that I did last year. Um, there's a lot of issues at play here when, tap, um, when weaving tapestry. And I do have to say that understanding the techniques of tapestry is very, very helpful for design. Um, you have to understand things like um, that set matters. If you only have war eight warp ends per inch, you don't have and you're just weaving something that's like postcard size, you don't have a lot of area for detail. Um, so that has to inform your design choices. If you're weaving huge pieces um, at 8 EPI, you have far more latitude just just make things bigger and you can put more detail in, but at a small, a small piece with a um, fairly large set like 8 EPI, there's not a lot of detail there and that has to inform what choices you make about design. Um, not, I'm not saying that choosing a smaller set like 12 or 20 is a better choice. I'm just saying that you cannot weave, don't come to me with a photograph and say, I want to weave this 5 by 7 inches at 8 API because it's impossible. You have to simplify things. Um, you should remember that horizontal lines are easy to weave in tapestry and smooth um, vertical lines, unless they are straight, are difficult. So that informs a lot of my design decisions. As I see things and I'm thinking about weaving them, I think about whether I can make the line the way I want it to um, on the gridded format that is tapestry. I think that's something that you learn over time is to look at things and translate it to what it would be like on a gridded woven grid. Um, so in part that just takes practice, but um, if you have a lot of vertical lines, you're not going to be able to weave them smoothly at an 8 EPI set, or even a 10 or a 12. Um, they will look stepped. Even when you're using all the techniques that there are to smooth those out. Um, let's see. Um, I think, I think I don't really realize I do this, but when I'm at a place like Petrified Forest where I was hiking for a month and looking at the environment and really thinking about things that I would weave. Um, I think you start to look at things in terms of a weaving like, is that beautiful horizontal curve weavable or is this something that's just going to be a photograph? Um, if I want something gentle and smooth, then I'm going to weave those lines horizontally. If I want jet, rocky and jagged, then um, weave it the other way and that's what you'll get. Um, when I was weaving the Petrified Forest pieces, I was in a very different environment um, than my normal life, and that is worth noting. Um, I was living in a very, very quiet place by myself for a month at the top of the park. The gates were locked at 5 p.m., and there was no one else behind the gate except me and whatever law enforcement officer was patrolling. Um, I had a lot of time and very little access to the internet, and I had told everybody not to email me. So that was really critical to uh, creativity. That doesn't exist in my normal life, so I have to create that for myself, or I should create that for myself. Practically, at Petrified Forest, I hiked every day. For most of the day, I took a lot of photos, and I did some sketching. Um, I am not yet a person who draws a lot, but I notice that when I do sit down to sketch something that I'm looking at, it completely forces you to look carefully. 
um, and I saw, I, when I do draw, I see a lot of things that I wouldn't otherwise notice in terms of forms and where lines go. Um, that national park is one that is quite stark, lots of horizontal lines and big horizons, which lend themselves to tapestry, but I also noticed that I didn't weave any big horizons the whole time I was there, and I think that's because I had limited myself to a format of two by two inches. They were, you know, the tapestries were about this big, and so I was thinking about details, and so I wove everything that I wove was a detail of something. So that's a just a thing to think about in terms of what limitations are you placing on yourself and what is that going to um, produce. Hi Alice, yes this will be available for a, a viewing right afterwards, it'll go right up on Facebook, so don't worry if you're late. Um, so at the end of the day at Petrified Forest I would review the photos I took that day and often um, I didn't have a printer Often I would look at a photo on the computer screen and sketch it into my journal if I hadn't already sketched something similar that day. And that was a really good way of simplifying the photograph. Photographs have way too much information um, to use for a tapestry cartoon. And one of the hardest things for me to communicate to students when they come to a design class and they bring a photograph and they say I want to weave this is how to simplify um, that photograph. So this worked for me at the park was I didn't actually have a printer so I didn't have what I might have done at home was print that photo out and then try to trace out the lines but that would lead me to trace probably too much of what was there so I would sketch right from the computer screen and end up with a um, cartoon that was much more weavable in the small space that I had um, let's see what else did I do um, good way to, that's a good way to pick out the salient details in a photograph, I think. Um, and sometimes having limitations on what you're doing. For example, if you did a tapestry diary and, you, diary and you're only allowed to use four colors or something, those kind of limitations do force you to be creative. Um, so that two by two inch limitation at Petrified Forest forced me to do a lot of things that I would not normally do because I usually weave much larger um, and then let me end this question with a quote from um, Twyla Tharp, which was from this, The Creative Habit book. Um, the first steps of a creative act are like groping in the dark, random and chaotic, feverish and fearful, a lot of busyness with no apparent or definable end in sight. And it really does feel like that, I think, when you're first starting. If you're grasping for something, like scratching in the dirt, hoping something will come up. And that's totally normal. And I think some of us get so afraid of feeling that, that we don't go any further. Recognize the fear and the groping, groping and be okay with it. Um, that's how new projects come to be. And the, the final thing might be nothing like your original design. My original design for this tapestry, I should have pulled it out. It looks absolutely nothing like this. It was a field of little dots, basically. Um, the entire thing was circles. And it was uh, even a completely different shape. Um, it's okay. It, the concept even changed completely from this final tapestry. Um, the first thing was, the first idea was about falling, and this idea became about growth and moving forward. So, what you're working on might change completely in the course of working on it, and it's okay to be afraid. Just keep going. Um, Julie asked, how did you discover your personal voice in tapestry weaving? And this was the question I did not want to answer, Julie, but I'm going to. Um, I am going to be totally honest and say, so she's asking, how did you discover your personal voice in tapestry? And I'm going to be totally honest and say, I don't think I'm there yet. Maybe everybody would say that. I don't know. Um, it's scary to say that in a public forum. I don't think I'm there yet, but it's true. Um, I know what some of my personal voices, and a couple years ago, I might have told you confidently how I got to my personal voice and what it was. But at this point, I think um, I've been around long enough, and I've seen enough work of other artists, and I've talked to enough people. Um, to know that the older I get and the more I learn, the more I feel like there is to learn. There's so much that I don't know. And so, um, 
the last three years have been um, really stressful and trying to make a living as a teacher. And so I have not had enough time to work on my personal voice. And that is also scary, but um, it's also kind of refreshing to know that there's a place to go. It's exciting. It's like there's still all this land to be conquered and things to be explored. So what I will say is, with as far as I've come with my personal voice, um, is that my work comes mostly from the things that I love. So that's probably true for many of us. Um, the things that I weave have to do with space and time and feelings. Um, much more than specific images. Other people are completely opposite from me. They want to depict a very specific image that says something um, very recognizable. And I'm more interested in conveying a feeling of space and challenging the viewer to maybe even come up with their own explanation. Um, I was introduced to gradation dyeing and weaving in college and by my teacher, James Kohler. Um, and I loved it so much that it's often the centerpiece of my work, just plain color gradations. Um, that aspect comes from a love of color, the feeling of space I can get in a piece by using uninterrupted gradations, um, and my love of the process of dyeing. And that's probably a big key that I love this particular process. And so it really informs what I do in terms of the final piece. Um, there's also a particular weaving style that's necessary to weave the gradations the way that I want them that is well suited to my use of this countermarch Harrisville rug loom that I use. It's a great big horizontal warp loom with a big overhead beater that I use a lot of the time when I'm weaving. And it makes a very even thin fabric that I really like. All of those things work together as the foundations of my work. Um, but you might have a completely different set of tools, um, different processes, different things that you love, and your work, of course, is going to look very different than mine as a result of those loves of different, even different processes. You like to buy your yarn. You like a different kind of loom. You use different tools. You like a different set. Um, all of that impacts the final work, and it's fine. Um, so the direction I take my personal vision from here um, has to do with what I'm thinking about at the moment. Um, the Petrified Forest and Hambage residencies this past year were huge gifts for me in terms of just having time. Petrified Forest was a whole month and Hambage was two weeks. Um, it was just allowed me to experience time that was devoted to art making and um, understand some new directions for my work. I then spent several months almost exclusively teaching, and um, but the next nine months I get to weave a commission. So I'm really looking forward to that. And um, scheduling creative time is my go-to for how to make that creativity happen. And I encourage you to think about that schedule also. And I mean something like, 15 minutes every morning I go and I work on my tapestry diary or 15 minutes at night before I go to bed I write an entry in my art journal or I do some doodle or I pick up my knitting or I spin or something like that. I just think it's important to carry that forward as often as we can. Okay, so Carolyn asked, um, any advice on how to transform inspiration from another person's painting or photo or other artwork um, into a tapestry without just copying all or part of it? That's a great question, Carolyn. Um, I'm going to recommend a book to you especially and anyone else who has this question about copying or stealing or those sorts of things. Um, Austin Cleon, Steal Like an Artist. So sorry, it's backwards. Um, Austin Cleon, Steal Like an Artist. Um, fairly inexpensive little book. It's quite um, popular for good reason. Um, it will put your mind at ease, I think. Uh, he gives some great guidelines, and um, it's, it's all about learning from other artists. The basic premise, which I do agree with in Austin's book, um, is that there is nothing new under the sun. It has all been done before in some way, shape, or form. And that is actually a relief to me anyway. Um, we learn by looking at what other people do and copying the best 
of what we see, um, you know, from the people that we like the most. You develop your own way of doing things by admiring other people's work and looking at it and researching it and thinking about why it is you like it. And then you put all of those ideas together and it becomes your own thing. It's not that you're going to make a copy of somebody else's work. It's almost impossible to do that in tapestry anyway, unless the original work you're looking at is a piece of tapestry. Um, even then, it would be hard. So don't worry so much about copying. Of course, if you're making an exact copy of something, you have to credit the source and you can't show it, and all those things about copyright are very important. But I think we worry too much about it, and I think that it's important to learn from other people. Hi, Cliff. Glad you're here. I got people from all over the world here. That's so fun. Um, I think Cliff is in Australia. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so art students have learned for millennia by copying from the great artists. Uh, if this is something you want to do, copy one particular work by someone, you can do it. Um, you just have to credit them. You probably can't show it. It probably can't go in a jury show and you probably can't even sell it. But it's okay if you do it for your own education. Um, let's see. So, basically, Cleon's talking about imitating a large number of artists, sort of putting together all the things that you love about them, and it actually will become your own work. If you're only um, looking at one particular artist, then it might become it might not be quite so fluid as it would if you look at, I think he recommends going to one artist you like and then look at the people that were their teachers and then look at the people that were their teachers. Um, just do some research. Um, you have to consider, of course, the medium that you're working in. A painting or a photograph is not necessarily going to be easily converted into tapestry. You have to think about why you like it and what things about it are weavable and what things about it are not weavable. Um, Limitations in color blending. Yarn is not the same thing as paint, and I don't like it when people say that tapestry is painting with yarn, because it is not the same thing at all. You can mix paint on a brush in endless ways. This does not happen with yarn, and we also have techniques we have to use. So um, it's misleading to say that tapestry is painting with yarn. Um, you're being inspired by other works of art, but you are not copying most of the time. So anyway, read Austin Kleon's book, Steal Like an Artist, if you haven't read it. It's really fun, and it costs like 10 bucks, so. Um, or you can get it at your library, or you can probably get it on Kindle, or a million other ways. So, um, let's see. I will see if you have some other questions. But um, I did design, so I have been watching students for years now, both in online workshops and um, um, in person workshops and have seen this issue over and over of I don't know what to weave. I love this thing that we do with yarn but I don't know what to weave. And um, I designed that weaving tapestry on Little Looms class with that in mind because I feel like sometimes tapestry is put on a pedestal and we think you know it's so hard and it takes all this training and there's all these techniques we have to learn and um, I think that tapestry is an art form that can be very approachable. It doesn't have to have all these rules and it doesn't have to feel so hard. So I designed that Little Looms class with that in mind, that just play with it. Um, just have fun. Eventually maybe that will become something you do all the time every day, and maybe not, but um, don't be so hard on yourself about the outcome. Um, so don't, I guess the thing is, the final outcome for me isn't, what's, as, isn't what is important most of the time. It is if I'm doing a commission. But a lot of the times, the final outcome is not that important. The process is what is important. Um, for me, maybe not for you, but um, I encourage you to let go of that wish for the perfect little tapestry, especially not if you have just started weaving. It's not maybe going to win awards or be in the MoMA or anything, but who cares if you have fun making it and you learn something along the way. Um, if you are interested in that little online class, um, this is my little plug for today. Um, this is a, oh, it's backwards, and I've rubbed out some of it with my toe. Wow. Um, 
If you're interested in the online class, there's a discount code that's Little Looms, Little with then a capital L O O M S 25. Um, they'll give you 25% off that class if you haven't seen it yet. Um, oh, and I wanted to mention I had one cancellation a day or two ago in my Colorado August retreat, August 5 to 9. If you're not in Australia and you want to come, there's one opening. So be, go easier on yourself is what I'm trying to say. Um, let yourself explore. Make time to be creative, for God's sake. Um, we have such fast-paced, crazy lives, a lot of us. And um, I am mostly talking to myself right now, and I hope it helps somebody else. But make time every day to do something creative that primes the pump and gets you um, going. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> Thanks, Dorina. They said I'm so funny, which is helpful because sometimes I feel like a great big dork. Um, um, so actually a final story for you. My teacher, James Kohler, was a Benedictine monk. Um, and he, this was before I met him, he learned to weave in the monastery and he was just weaving fabric, which they actually sold to help support the, the monastery. They wove ruanas and other um, things that you would weave in the 70s. Um, and he literally spent his prayer time at the loom every day, weaving fabric. Um, he ended up leaving the monastery in part because they got a new prior, and the new prior insisted that he spend his prayer time in his cell. So, um, and that was not okay for him. Prayer was time at the loom. So, what I'm saying is that a practice like this can be a really underlying part of our lives as creative people. And I think it's nice to think about it that way. Not that you have to become a monk. But, or even that it's at all remotely religious, just that it's a practice that helps support our lives in a um, positive way. Um, so give yourself 15 minutes and a day, or, you know, four hours if you have it, for goodness sake, if you have a lot of time. It, um, make stuff. Um, and then self-confidence. I think women especially have very little self-confidence, a lot of us, and um, we don't want to show other people what we make because we don't think it's good enough and that's not true um, but if you really can't show anyone make it anyway and don't show anyone and then find one friend who you know is supportive and show it to them and eventually you will have confidence um, I have this little tape in my head from when I was um, I'm also crazy that's what that is um, <laughs> I have this little tape in my head from when I, I spent a year weaving um, at Northern New Mexico College with a Rio Grande weaver named Karen Martinez, and she used to yell across this great big adobe building we worked in. There were like five of us there, but it was huge. She would yell across and say, have some self-confidence, and I remember that all the time. So that's what I'm telling you all, have some self-confidence. So do you have other questions? I have about seven more minutes. Um, I like that Michelle. Michelle says she's retired, so she has the luxury of going to the loom first thing in the morning, even if it's only for 10 minutes. And I really, um, I think that's a great practice, um, which is probably why Michelle has made such amazing things over the last few years. Oh, good question, Linda. Linda asked, commissions aside, Thinking more of something like the Petrified Forest series, is the viewer a part of your designing and thinking, or is it just you in the tapestry? That is an excellent question. Um, a lot of the time for me, I'm not thinking about the viewer. I have to be honest that I am mostly not weaving for other people. Um, most of the stuff I weave is just on spec. I'm not sure I'm ever gonna sell it. Usually I do sell it, but um, I have a lot more joy in the process if I weave something that is in my heart right now to weave. So of course commissions aside, um, I will not take a commission that doesn't fit into something that's attractive to me in terms of um, technique or just the joy of weaving. If it's a commission I'm going to hate weaving, I won't take it um, because for obvious reasons. Then the, I think that artwork won't be good either if I don't love the making of it. But like the Petrified Forest tapestries, I actually never had any intention of even showing those anywhere. They're at a show in Georgia right now with some of Janet Austin's pieces, but um, mine are tiny. I mean, Janet and Tommy and all the rest of the people in the show have wonderful, 
you know, decades long um, tapestry diaries in the show, but I never intended to show those P EFO, the Petrified Forest pieces. I wanted them just for myself to remember. I really literally did them as a diary. They were just to remember what I did there every day. So um, I'm happy to share them because the, it ended up that it was a lot of fun and I want to encourage other people to do that, but usually it's just for me. Even true with like the piece that's behind me, which is called, um, this is called Lifelines. And that was definitely a piece that was just something that I was working on. I spent a couple of years working on the design and um, something that I wanted was about just the process of living and, and how things just sort of beads sort of string along on in your life and become a whole life before you really understand what's happening. Um, let's see. MK, the little looms, let me rewrite the part that I rubbed out with my toe and we'll pretend we have some mirror writing. Um, little looms code was L I T T L E capital L and then capital L O O M S 25. I'll put that in the comments too. Um, that's for the weaving tapestry on little looms class. Um, and Michelle was talking again about she was spends a little bit of the time every day and it doesn't really matter how much you get done just that you did something and I think that's true you might have a terribly busy day and there are things in life you know you have a flat tire you have kids you have whatever there are things in life that happen but if you can give yourself 10 minutes a day that's a good start um, yay Sue I'm glad you're going to see the tapestry diaries they are in Athens Georgia at Linden House Arts Center right now. Um, Anne, <laughs> that's a great question, Anne. Anne said, I think about designs right side up, but some need to be woven sideways. How do you get your brain to accept that? <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, this piece behind me was woven sideways. And, um, you know, I think that at some point when I'm drawing the cartoon, things just flip for me. I know that I want the curves a particular way and they have to be woven the other way to make that happen. And I follow a cartoon pretty strictly, so I'm banking on the cartoon to help my brain make that switch. But actually, once I'm weaving for a few days, I totally start seeing it a different way. It's like that exercise in um, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. Betty Edwards has a book called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. If you want to learn how to sketch, um, that's an old classic book, and she has you turn to copy a drawing but turn it upside down and your brain completely dissociates from what the image is and you learn to draw just by looking at the lines. I think it's kind of like that, that my brain sort of forgets what the image is because it's a lot of my work isn't image based. It's, it's a lot of colors and forms and stuff, but for the most part, I'm not trying to weave a face. I think it would be different if I was trying to weave something realistic and I was weaving it upside down and backwards. It might be a little more difficult to do that. In which case, you probably want to weave it right side up. Okay. Um, you all have been awesome. Thank you all for showing up. If you missed um, things or whatever, this will be live again, um, right on the same page in Facebook, Re Rebecca Mezoff Tapestry Studio. In like five minutes, they'll have the um, replay up. And I promise that I will look um, up how to make the things look the right direction. This is another book actually I haven't spent a lot of time with, but if you're interested in um, this idea about creativity, this is a fairly new book by Jane Dunnewald, D-U-N-N-E-W-O-L-D, called Creative Strength Training, which I think looks really interesting. If you like exercises using, she's actually a um, fiber artist, so she has exercises using paper and fiber and stuff. Um, just another one to look up. Let me know if you have fantastic references of your own. Put that in the comments. And I always like new books um, to pass along to people. So thanks so much for everything, you all. I will see you again soon. Happy Sunday. At least in the U.S., it's Sunday. <laughs>